Kelsey, in trying to understand the nature of memory, take human memory, I've always been astonished that we go from vast differences in order of magnitude to try to understand what memory is from subcellular uh, structure of proteins to huge brain circuits flowing back and forth between various areas of the cortex and everything in between. So the fundamental question is, what is a memory and where is it? That's a good question. <laughs> and I don't know still. that I have the answer to it. It's still a good question. And I do think just as because you... Because 45 years ago, when I was in this institute getting my PhD, that was the question. Well, I'm just back after 45 years. You, what progress have you made? Well, we're still asking what's the engram of memory. Right, but I, right. you know, the way that I think about it, maybe the progress I is that we're that realizing word. that maybe that's not necessarily the, the right question. That memory is somewhat more dynamic of a process. Uh -huh. I would say that the memory is stored in the circuit. I study synapses, the sites of communication between neurons and individual neurons. But it's memory for me really is an emergent property of all of those individual components. Mm. I think that we know um, from human lesion studies that memories are stored in particular areas of the brain so that there really is a physical seat for memories. Um, I like to think about memories being stored as biochemical changes or, or genetic changes in the, in the neurons, whether it's at the level of changes in gene expression or in the level of what's called epigenetics, where the DNA itself can undergo modifications that might last through a few generations mm -hmm. um, and change the way that gene expression is um, uh, regulated. Uh, and those are actual memories? Well, there or their could instincts, be. Uh, there, no, I, I mean, I th well, even that instinct in memory, we have a lot of automatic memories yeah, right, right. that we may not be conscious of. Right, sure. But there's certainly memories. Even our our, our personality is certainly, um, in a funny way, a memory of how we were brought up sure. and what we expect sure. out of the world, sure. um, how we expect things to happen, and and what we project onto whatever is right, happening. Right. So that. So but you see, I, a memory then is an emergent property of large numbers of neurons. I, yeah. And what you study is the individual connection between the neurons. Right. So how, 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 do we, how do we bridge the gap? How does the emergence occur? Right. Well, so my belief is that once we understand how those uh, changes occur at the level of individual synapses, then we have tools that we can manipulate to understand in an animal how that affects memory. So for example, if a gene is identified that's important for synaptic plasticity. That gene can plasticity be mean the change. change. So it re is important for the change in synaptic strength in response to a stimulus. Right. That gene can be mutated in an animal, whether it's a, a worm or a fly or a mouse, so an experimentally tractable animal system. And then their, their ability to form new memories can be tested. And then we learn something about how the whole circuit works and how the individual components contribute, the synapses and the neurons contribute to the um, storage of memory in the so circuit. So if, for example, you knock out a single gene mm -hmm. and that gene is responsible for the synthesis of a certain kind of protein, and if you eliminate that, you see the impact it has on memory or where in the nervous system it has that, and that can give you an understanding of, of, the, uh, of the original of, of normal functioning. Right. Right. So I that that's that's my you know that's my sort of philosophy. It's why I'm so focused on trying to understand these very fundamental mm -hmm. mechanisms of of what we call plasticity so the change in synaptic strength with experience because we believe that that's going to help us ultimately understand how memories are stored in the brain. So if we just take a round number and say each individual neuron of which the human brain has how many? Would you say? A uh, hundred billion or a trillion, so. It's someplace in a hundred billion in the cortex, mm -hmm. trillion overall, yeah, however yeah. it worked. And each one will be connected to a thousand or some people say 10,000 different right. neurons in the synapses. And you're studying each individual one, one out of a quadrillion or right. number of synapses. So uh, let me ask you a naive question. How many changes in individual synapses do you have to have to create the simplest kind of, of memory that we might have as humans? I don't have an answer to that. I mean, what's oh. an order of magnitude? Is it is it 100? 
Is it a million? Is it a billion? Oh, well, I would say more on the order of a hundred than a million, okay. <laughs> or tens okay. of changes. Well, well, that, that, that's, that's fine. what I'm saying. And they're on mm -hmm. all different levels, you know. So I, again, I, I think very molecularly, there are changes in the proteins that are there. There are changes sure. in the modifications to the proteins sure. that are there, and those all change the functioning of that synapse. So they'll change the functioning of the circuit, and oh, they'll change okay. what we experience as memory. So you you might think that a few hundred neurons connected by these synapses, mm -hmm. changes in that could be the simplest memory bit, if you will. Yeah, I, I would think so, or maybe even fewer neurons than that even in fewer. a circuit. Because I mean, you, are, on the you work on, on very simple animals that have very, very few neurons. Simple circuit, right. And they're able to at least l express a, a rudimentary memory. Right, right. So how many do you need? Well, there, you um, certainly need more than two, and the exact number, whether it's 40 or is, yeah. is, is not clear. Not because million. one of the reasons it's difficult to say that is because if you take out one important component, you might lose the memory, but it doesn't right, say right, that right. the circuit isn't larger. Right, sure, sure. Um, and that makes it difficult to really quantitatively mm -hmm. assess how many, how many neurons. But still, that's need. remarkable if you think about it, because these neurons are so small and so seemingly uh, about nothing other than sending an electrical impulse and suddenly that, ex that combination of neurons sending impulses and chemicals is about something, and yeah. it's about a memory, yeah. and it represents a memory in that, in that context. It's kind of, uh, kind of very uh, strange to think about it in that way. I, I find it comforting personally. I don't, you know, I do like the idea that um, our brains, that the neurons in our brains are constantly responding to everything that's around mm. us. Mm. I often wish they responded more. <laughs> I think that a lot of the problems in people's individual lives and in the, in the world come from the fact that the br people's brains aren't as responsive, so they sort of get set earlier. Um, sometime in development. Well, what don't. does that mean about the longevity of memory? As you see, as yeah. you've studied memory, uh, as you go across time, we all know what short-term working memory yeah. is. When I remember a telephone number and then forget it two minutes later, or if I remember something to cram for a test, right. and so I remember something for a day or two, and then of course we have lifelong memories that I can never, or never forget. Um, so, uh, how would each one of those be encoded within neurons? So I do think that there's going to be a role for different parts of the brain. So memories that are mediated by the amygdala, so emotional memories tend to be very, very long lasting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, there will certainly be memories that uh, end up not hardwiring the brain, but really putting uh, in a structure, in a circuit that's going to be very persistent. Um, and shorter term memories are going to be memories that are going to be more flexible so that uh, when I say shorter term, I mean a long term memory, but that one that isn't uh, an entire lifetime memory. Do you see the difference being at the circuitry level or at the, uh, the synaptic level or, or, or really at both? At both. I mean, I don't differentiate between those two levels that much because the synapses hmm. are what connect all the neurons in a circuit. So when the synapses change, the circuit changes. So I, I, it's harder for me to see that there's such a difference. I mean, there certainly are changes in neuromodulators that come in, but I really do think of those as being uh, very interconnected. Changes in circuits, changes in synapses. I think of it as the synapses, the fundamental unit of the circuit. And so if that changes, the circuit changes. Certainly, but one wants to know where that engram of memory yeah, yeah. is. What's the core of it? And if it's at the synapse, then, then it, it might be the case that that engram is at a very molecular level, as opposed to the molecular change just be a way to change the whole circuit. I mean, it's a different way of thinking about it. It is, two, a, two yeah, it is a different way of thinking about it. Um, I think you need the circuit. This, you need the circuit for the behavior of memory. You need okay. the circuit for the experience of memory. Um, but the circuit can't change without the synopsis. Right. So again, it's hard for me to dissociate them. Um, I would not say that the, it's hard for me to say the memory stored at the synapse. I mm. think that's too simplistic. Okay. I really think that you have to have that whole circuit to have all those changes that are then going to result in a, in a change that is like a memory, something that we really experience as a memory. So memory then is, is emergent out of the circuitry which is built of the plasticity of the synapses. Well, I believe so.